Ah, thank you so much. Um, I feel very honored to uh, have been asked to, to come here. It's also very humbling uh, ask to speak about something as complex as depth. Um, and I want to start off with um, acknowledging and reminding myself of uh, an intention that I, uh, I want to show up here and be here not as any of the, the roles and identities that I have in my life. And uh, I just want to show up as authentically and, and real as me as I can here. Um, I'm, I also want to remind myself that and be aware of the humane needs to uh, feel validated and valued that I also have. And um, that I'm not here to impress anyone. I'm not here to make you think highly of me. Um, I'm just here to share some of my perspectives and hopefully inspire to some action. And all of the things that I'm going to talk about is uh, just my subjective perspective. It's based on uh, a lot of research, but uh, also a lot of personal exploration and experience. So this is the flow. I'm going to start because it makes sense. Just a few minutes about my journey, how I ended up, where I am. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit what I think depth is in relationships and how we can create more of it and also what limits it. And if there's time in the end and if the energy feels right, um, there's also a brief exercise that we can do. All right, let's start. So this is me. I uh, grew up in the early 90s, um, single kid with a single mom. And um, my mom was working in the travel industry. So from very early on, I, um, I got a very strong curiosity for the world out there and different cultures and different perspectives. And she always brought back different toys and exotic things from stories and pictures from different countries. Um, but being alone or growing up as a single child also meant that I spent a lot of time alone. And when I'm asking myself the big question, how did I end up where I am and how did I end up spending five years nerding into human connection and relationships, I think that the simple and maybe a little bit sad answer is that I spent a lot of time alone in my life and I've been feeling lonely a lot. Uh, and that's usually, I think, how it is when you have some very, very strong motivation or, or passion. Um, so I ended up uh, studying actually very close to here. I'm from Malmö originally, but moved up here and ended studying at a business school. Uh, and at this point, very influenced by uh, what I should do and what my mind said that would give me the best uh, opportunities, not so much in my heart at this point in my life early on. Uh, but that's something that would come to change quite rapidly and um, so back in 2012 when I started my career uh, I had a career for five six years where I worked for H&M and uh, in in many aspects it's what uh, people call a like a rocket career it went uh, super fast and um, super successful uh, in the conventional terms and this is a picture of me in Bangladesh um, I was working there for almost three years, and then in China, and in uh, Spain, and a little bit in Brazil. Um, and during this time, I was becoming more and more, like dropping down more and more in my heart from the, the brain. But I was still very, like, determined, very steered around uh, myself and my development and maximize my own experiences. But it, there was also a shift happening here where uh, it was almost as the more success I achieved, the emptier it felt. And in the end, I was living the, the life that I sort of had dreamed of or set up as, as a vision for myself. And uh, I was in Barcelona and uh, I had everything that I could wish for there. And still, I really felt like I was lacking meaning. And uh, there was one night where I just woke up in the middle of the night and almost had like a panic attack. And then I just realized, okay, I just need to, I, I need to do something drastic, I need, I need to change. So I left that entire life uh, to 
sort of uh, start to search more in my heart for a direction. And um, meaning was the key word that I felt that I was lacking, right? So I did a lot of research. I left uh, Barcelona and I sold almost all of my belongings um, and moved to Brazil and roared the, the jungles and the beaches of Brazil for a few months uh, with the, the intention of really like digging into, but what is it that, um, that is, builds meaning? And one of the, I love frameworks uh, that simplify complex topics such as meaning. And this is, this is one, there's a TED talk about it. If you search for four pillars of meaning, it's a really good short TED talk. Um, and for me, this, this sort of became a structure, a framework for building my life. And the four pillars is, is belonging, sense of belonging, uh, purpose, transcendence, and storytelling. Um, and I'm going to focus mainly on the two first ones. So I, um, based on this, I sort of came back. Let's just see if oh, there's one slide missing. This one, I missed this one. Um, so this is me in uh, Brazil, in one of those deserted beaches. And this is also one of the toughest moments uh, of my life, the toughest periods where I had left everything that made up my identity. And I felt incredibly lost sitting under this bush by myself, under the rain, listening to some classical music and trying to figure out where I'm going in life and how do I build a meaningful life. Where my um, personal values was a tool that really helped me to, to find a direction of, but what is it that is important to me in, in the life? And what do I need? So uh, it sort of shifted from being uh, an, a presence with a lot of anxiety and feeling very lost. And at some point, it shifted to this of just realizing that, OK, now that I am no one and I have no identity anymore, I can be anyone. And I started seeing my life as this blank canvas. And based on these four pillars of meaning, I started building each pillar. And the first pillar, uh, belonging, was uh, very much fulfilled by moving into a uh, co-living space here in Stockholm with 55 people. And there's quite a few of my fellow housemates here today in the room. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for supporting. Um, and I, it was not enough for, to, to just live with 55 people uh, from all over the world, but I also shared a room with three other people uh, during four years. And I, th I think it, it's really coming from the background of having spent a lot of time alone and feeling al lonely a lot. I really like, went to the other side of the spectrum, going all into, okay, what is human connection and this belonging? Like, how, do I, how do I maximize that in my life? And so for me, it was really human experience, experiment in a way of um, living so intimately with people that really became my family and um, created such a strong sense of belonging. And I think the biggest lesson from that was that like, that strong sense of belonging, which of, of course is also applicable to any relationships or groups, for me really uh, created like a foundation of safety from which I could venture out into the world and be a lot more daring because there was this like safe space and like the safety net was really high back home. Um, so it really having that sense of safety and belonging really enabled me to show up and live my life fully and be more daring in, and showing myself more. And so the pillar of belonging was like, it felt like, wow, okay, this, this is strong. Um, and the pillar of purpose was the next one. And during a lot of this research on meaning and well-being, it was a pretty conclusive argument among the, the research and science that our relationships is the biggest contributing factor to our sense of well-being uh, and that the quality of our, of our relationships really sets the quality of our life. 
And also coming from my background, I think I, was, I had two main passions and it was um, inner development, the personal development and human connection. So I wanted to do something that combined both and luckily I also had the perception that the self-awareness and the inner, inner development is a key contributing factor to human connection and to be able to have a, a deep connection with someone. So I started a company called Relate. Um, we call ourselves a relationship tech company. So our mission is sort of to um, develop different digital tools that help people connect in a, deeper, in a deeper way and build more meaningful and healthy relationships. And uh, the biggest product that we have is actually an, an alternative values-based dating app for people that are looking for a new partner called Relate Date. Uh, we also have an app for couples to deepen their relationship with different scientific exercises. Um, and we have a podcast that uh, is now actually Sweden's biggest podcast when it comes to relationship advice from different experts. So it's a different experts, expert in each episode talking about um, how to build a healthy relationship. And we do a range of other things with articles and self-assessment tests. So this has really become my purpose to help people um, to deeper connection and more sense of belonging in their relationships. Yeah. And I just want to briefly mention uh, the other two pillars. I'm not going to talk about them so much here. Um, but transcendence is not as uh, fussy or big as it seems. For me, transcendence is, for example, when you get in the zone. It could be when you're studying or writing something that you're very passionate about. It can be in sports. Uh, it can also be in medita meditation. It's, it's not enlightenment. It's just moments of being in the zone where you exist beyond space and time. And uh, they can be created in a lot of different ways. But the biggest game changer has actually been storytelling. And storytelling, what it means is basically the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And that has been the biggest game changer for me in, in becoming aware of the stories that I tell myself about myself from childhood and from growing up and years and decades of these stories being, um, being formed. And like just becoming aware of that and getting the option to break loose from that and to sort of reframe those stories, I think is the, the po most powerful transformative things we can do as, as humans. So those are the four different pillars of meaning that I really set out to rebuild and create a new life from. And that's how I ended up spending five years in really nerding in human connection and relationships, and not just professionally through the company and the purpose, but in my private in life, whole living space, in the very intimate group, uh, but also in my romantic relationships. They really became like this, um, in Swedish, we call it Abetskada, like uh, when you're, you're bringing your work home, right? So I was really, if I discovered something new or so, some new ideas or in, around relationships, I immediately wanted to, to test it and experiment it. So um, I think my, my past partners have been quite like this, <laughs> um, been, been having to do a lot of experimentation. But um, So that's uh, the background of of why I'm here, and that's uh, what has created the perspectives that I'm gonna share. And I, again, just wanna say that this is really my subjective perspectives. Uh, I would love to hear your perspectives later afterwards, if there's anyone who uh, have some additions. Of course, this is still limiting, it's just one person's perspective. Um, this is one definition I'm gonna come up with one that resonates even stronger with me later, but a strong sense of connection and belonging with another person where we feel safe, seen and understood as we are fully. And this, the circle of, of depth, um, this is something that I, uh, I try to visualize and this comes from mainly from personal experience of really tr going into exploration and experimenting in my, uh, in this case, romantic relationship of how can we 
really create a zone of, of complete trust and, and depth in our connection. And of course the foundation is presence to really set aside side time and not be or, or to be undisturbed when you're actually connecting and, and speaking and sharing. But it really starts, uh, as, as probably some of you have heard about Brene Brown and like, yeah, the power of vulnerability, and it really starts with taking a, the, a leap of faith and being vulnerable. Um, I think some people think that you have to have a certain level of trust first and then you can be vulnerable. But I'd like to argue that it's the other way around. You create trust through um, being daring and being vulnerable and sharing your heart's truth. And then committing to full honesty of really both stepping into, okay, let's be completely transparent with how we feel and how we think. And in my experience, then, this really creates a... The, the more transparent you dare to be and build up, the more trust you also feel in the relationship. And the trust in turn leads to a sense of safety and psychological safety, that I feel safe and that safety enables me to lean in to the relationship, which ultimately creates more intimacy and more sense of connection. And this just loops. The more intimacy that you feel, the more present you can be with your partner or the person that you have a relationship with. And my experience is that this really is like this positive spiral that maybe you start with being a little bit vulnerable and then you notice how much more trust that builds and how you feel closer to that person. And that sort of encouraged me to be even more vulnerable. And I, it almost became this, this quest, okay, how vulnerable can we be? How transparent can we be? And how much trust can we have in this relationship? So this is the, the sort of the mindset that I have with me when I go into relationships, when I really want to connect and build a very strong, deep connection. So this is the my definition that, that really resonates with me, and it's on the, the side of the daring to be vulnerable. I think like the real depth in a human connection is when you can meet in the shadows, and when you can meet each other, uh, both respect and, and honor each other's weaknesses and shadow sides. We're all human, but when you feel that you don't have to hide them, but you can actually show up fully as 100% with all your sides and be respected and, and honored for it, um, then that's, that's, that's really a deep connection for me. And there was one more thing that I think I want to include maybe in the circle as well, and it's acceptance. Uh, openness and acceptance, I think, is another key to this and to this, um, to not judge each other and a way to respecting and, and honoring each other's shadows is that, is to really have an open mind and to accept and realize that we are all humans, we all have all of these spectras in us. So, some uh, limitations. This was actually a conversation I had the other day around the lunch table with my fellow team members at Relate, because uh, I asked them before this talk what they think that depth in relationships is, and we started talking about what limits creating depth, which was a really interesting conversation, so I, I, I um, wanted to share that as well. Um, and I think to some, some degree, uh, a limitation to really connecting deeply is core differences. And there's two things that I think of here, and it's uh, core values, which is something that we work a lot with re at Relate, um, where you just have very distinctively different core values. I think it will be difficult to really understand where the other person is coming from on a deeper level. 
And the second thing that came to mind here is personality. Um, there's, I'm sure some of you are familiar with different personality type tests and Myers-Briggs is one of the big one with 16 personalities and the big five. And um, <clears throat> there's actually this interesting matching matrix of all Myers-Briggs Myers 16 different personality types. So you have 16 times 16, and then you can see a color-coded how, how well they all match. And one sort of common denominator is where, when it's really not a good match, if is one person is very intuitive and driven by emotions or emotional decision-making, and the other one is very um, like observative and very a, th a thinker. That's also like, it can, it can be interesting combination uh, and definitely work-wise and in different other relationships, it can be very complementing. But I think when in a romantic relationship, when you, I think it can be a limitation to, to, to a deep connection for the same reason that you will, it will be challenging for the partners to really fully understand each other. And the quality of our attention is another limitation um, and I really see it in, a, in any relationship as like the, the sort of weakest link sort of uh, defines the level that you can go and it's valid for your ability to stay present in that connection and in that relationship as well when you're, when you're meeting. And also self-awareness, um, especially if you're thinking about my definition of meeting in the shadows and being able to respect and honor each other's differences, it, you have, you have, it starts with you. Like it starts with knowing what your different shadows are, right? And seeing the full aspect of, of your humanity. And of course, ability to communicate, but not just communicate and express yourself, but just as importantly to, to listen and to make space for listening. And of course, intention and commitment of uh, really like committing to wanting a deep connection and committing to the person that you are connecting with. Yeah, so I wanted to finish off with um, some tips for uh, how I think we can all create deeper connections in our relationships. And uh, the first one is to prepare yourself before you go into meeting with a partner or whoever it is that you're connecting with and connect with yourself first. Like to really sense like, okay, how am I feeling right now? And when I go into this meeting, and it can also be at work or any meeting, like which emotions, which lens am I going into this meeting with? And of course, of course, your posture and your body language, if you're meeting with a partner in an intimate space and you want to share or talk, it of course makes a big difference if you're like sitting like this or if you're genuinely open, relaxed, leaning in and ready to receive. And then listening. I think this is really a practice and an ability and a muscle that we can all be better at. Um, but present and, and active listening to, to really be there and not get lost in thoughts of something else. And this is mindfulness, of course, but with another person and in, a, in an encounter. And uh, one practice is to try to avoid thinking about your next reply or, or what you're going to say, but really just taking in what the other person is saying. And one thing that has been huge for me is, is um, to do sharings and not have a conversation, but actually set a time. So if it's one minute or five minutes and one person speaks and then the other one agrees to not say anything, but just be there and just receive and just listen and then you can shift. Has that structure has been one of, one of the most powerful communication tools for me. And this is something that I quite recently started practicing and I'm very excited about. Because when we're in a conversation or when we're meeting someone, I am noticing that 
I very easily start comparing with myself. Like if I feel like, oh wow, I like, I like that too, or I'm also like this, I start uh, you know, getting stuck in that. Or, and I feel that that can be a bit limiting for me. And so I'm practicing right now to try to not compare myself with the other person of how similar we are. I think it's very natural, it's very a human need to, to feel similarity and safety. But I'm practicing to just stay in the curiosity and not go there in my mind. It's hard, it's very human need, but I'm, I'm experiencing that when I'm achieving it, like the, the openness uh, of me really receiving this person and seeing where that person is and where it's coming from instead of where I am coming from. It's, it's also a game shifter. And then the last one um, is just a, a tip, like ask reflective questions. Of course, when you have a conversation with someone, you can decide how deep you want to go in that relationship, depending on the questions that you ask and how much you want to learn about each other. These are some of my favorite questions um, that I like to ask in any, any form of relationship that really helps. Yeah, the phones indicate that, okay, this is good stuff. 